Welcome to today's American Security Project webinar. This is an on-the-record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, I will turn it over to ASP CEO, Patrick Costello. Thank you, Matthew. Good morning from Washington. I'm Patrick Costello. Uh, welcome to today's virtual meeting. It's been nearly 100 days since Russia invaded Ukraine, and we've all seen the images from Ukraine, the footage of millions fleeing their homes, truly heartbreaking and the level of destruction. But we've also seen the courage and resiliency of the Ukrainian people, which is inspiring. Uh, and most certainly, President Zelensky has emerged as a truly inspiring wartime leader. But perhaps most surprising at all has been the performance of Russia's military. With Ukraine having repelled Russian forces near Kyiv, the Kremlin's war of aggression has entered a new phase. Uh, the situation on the ground is still fluid. Having pulled back from the north and northeast, the Russians have upped the pace of their attacks in a more limited offensive in eastern Ukraine. Um, where Mr. Putin will stop is unclear. Joining us this morning to share his views on the war in Ukraine and its trajectory is General Philip Breedlove. General Breedlove had a distinguished career in the United States Air Force. He served as commander of US European Command, as well as the 17th Supreme Allied Commander Europe of NATO's Allied Command Operations post he held from May of 2013 until May of 2016. So he was present during the Russian invasion and seizure of Crimea in 2014. In a moment, I will yield the floor to General Breedlove for some initial comments before we open it up to conversation and your questions. Uh, please organize your thoughts during his opening, and you can submit your questions via the chat box or Q&A function, and I'll weave those into the conversation where appropriate. But General Breedlove, sir, thank you for joining us. We're honored to have you. Well, thank you, Patrick, for uh, providing an audience where I may learn just as much as they from the conversation. Um, I think what I'll do is just do some initial framing thoughts. You know, we're in a phase of the war where uh, Russia is still making incremental gains and Western nations are already trying to find a way to, to bring the fighting to an end and how that would be brought to an end is now going to be the subject du jour as we move forward. So some framing thoughts like rolling grenades out on a table and seeing what happens and then we'll get to the audience's Q&A, which is far more important than my remarks. First and foremost, we have to remember that this war is completely contrived by Mr. Putin. It was built for a purpose to advance Mr. Putin's worldview. Second, and, we, and I say this uh, in all sincerity, but not in belittling what's happening in Ukraine. And that is that this is bigger than Ukraine. We, we absolutely are uh, stunned and shocked by what Russia is doing inside of Ukraine. It is criminal. And all the reports now as we uncover land north of Lugansk and Donetsk in the, um, in the Kharkiv area, we start seeing that there are even worse atrocities there than there were in Bucha. And so this war is very tough on Ukraine, but it is bigger than Ukraine. If we look at the two draft and Mr. Putin and Lavrov and others called them treaties or agreements or signed documents that were ad given to us eight days before the war, and when we were given the documents, they said, sign them or there will be other means. We now know what that meant. But in those treaties, um, there were uh, aspirations by Mr. Putin of rearranging the world security architecture far bigger than Ukraine. In fact, it completely restructured the security architecture of Eastern Europe. Um, and I, I paraphrase badly, but these are the three points I took from that. That is that the weapons would be out of the near abroad, there would be less NATO in the near abroad, and there would be no US in the near abroad. And Mr. Putin was laying claim to that band of nations that essentially were his buffer states 
during the Warsaw Pact um, and Soviet Union days. A third major point is that the U.S., I believe, completely misread Russia. Frankly, the U.S. and the West completely misread Russia going into this, uh, this issue. Russia also completely misread Ukraine. They had no idea how fiercely Ukraine was going to fight. Uh, four large units that went into the Kiev area, rather than packing personal gears, the soldiers were directed to, pre to pack their, uh, their dress uniforms in order to participate in the parade that was expected within three or four days of the beginning of the invasion. So Russia completely misread uh, Ukraine. And then frankly, I was there about eight days before the war and our delegation spoke with everybody from President Zelensky down to uh, the opposing parties in the Rada. And it was pretty clear that we in the West totally misread Ukraine. In fact, President Zelensky in fairly harsh words admonished our small group of ambassadors and generals and said, you and the Western press have been watching what's happening on our border and have been amazed by the numbers of battalion task groups and what Russia was doing. What you were not paying attention to was what was already going on in our nation. Sabotage, threats, threats against schools, threats against buses, taking down of electrical grids, cyber attacks, all these things had already been taken. And then Mr. Zelensky said to us, what you also have not been looking at is what we have been doing in Ukraine. And that became imminently apparent when Russia attacked and Ukraine fought them so fiercely, respectfully in the North, for sure. Uh, Ukraine had been developing a defense in depth, as the army calls it, that was particularly well suited for taking down the kind of attack they expected from Russia. And then I will be provocative before I move on to questions. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna be to questions in just a minute, so get ready. I would submit that the Wests, and I include the United States in this, I will use that term, the Wests, uh, response three times. The West's response to the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008 was inadequate to task. It rewarded bad behavior. 20% of Georgia remains today in Russian hands. The West's response to the two invasions of Ukraine in 2014, the invasion and occupation of Ukrainian Crimea and the invasion and occupation of portions of the Donbass. The West's response was inadequate to task and rewarded bad behavior by leaving Crimea and the Donbass portions of it in Russian's hands. The West's response to the buildup prior to the war uh, some 103 days ago was inadequate to tasks. Our president assured us that his administration and he personally had explained to Mr. Putin the consequences of his action if he had um, um, invade, if he went on to invade. And I trust the president when he says he told him everything he was going to do. And Mr. Putin looked at it, decided that he could handle it and he invaded. So again, the West's response to this threat and ultimate invasion has so far been inadequate to task. And now we have to determine how we resolve this conflict. Will we once again reward bad behavior by giving Mr. Putin the land that he has grabbed in this war? Will our response be once again inadequate to task? And I think that is the question of today and, and maybe that will generate some, uh, some disagreement or uh, intellectually honest conversation. Thank you for allowing me to open.
Thank you, sir. Um, it's a really comprehensive opening. And I actually want to invite the audience to submit their questions through the Q&A function or the chat box. But let's, um, let's pick up where you left off. Um, you mentioned that the inadequacy of the West's response to a series of provocative actions from Russia over the last decade and a half. But I'm, I'm wondering how you think Russia interpreted um, their capability, particularly after the 2014 seizure of Crimea and invasion of Eastern Ukraine. It seems like they drew some, some false confidence there about their capabilities. And of course, contextualizing that is the lack of our own inadequacy of our own response. But just how do you think Russia interpreted their own military capacity, particularly in that 2014 episode? Let me answer uh, that in two ways. Um, and if I get so distracted, I forget your question. Remind me. But the fact of the matter is, I think they did draw conclusions. Just like I said, in 2008, they were rewarded for bad behavior. In 2014, they were rewarded for bad behavior. They showed up in 2022 and saw what the West was offering. And once again, it was sanctions and uh, they decided to, to go forward. So what they had confidence in is that they had deterred the West to a degree that the only response was going to be sanctions and sanctions have never, sanctions have never changed Mr. Putin's actions. Sanctions have certainly hurt the, the Russian people. Sanctions have certainly hurt the Russian economy. And sanctions and their actions have certainly hurt Russia's position as a nation on the world stage. But sanctions, I'll say it one more time, have never changed Mr. Putin's behavior. And so he's confident that he can weather this storm. Um, and, and so far, um, uh, he is. it looks like he's going to be yet again rewarded for bad behavior. Now, as far as their, uh, their military capabilities, um, what they did in Crimea was, I think, a, a, a masterful execution of what Gerasimov uh, used to call indirect, uh, indirect means, uh, asymmetric means, indirect actions. And, and really, there was no fight in Crimea. They had already subverted all of the organizations except for the small, four small um, uh, um, uh, military garrisons. Everybody had been bought off. Everybody had been prepared and it was throwing a light switch. And you could just basically look at Mr. Gerasimov's uh, approach on the internet and see how they executed. So there wasn't really a military component to that per se. Yes, there were military people there, but that was not a battle. And the fight in the Donbass uh, was not testing uh, the force that they put in there to do it. So I'm not sure that they grew confident from it. I just don't think that they got an adequate look at what was their problems based on the scope of what they had done either in the Donbass or the um, uh, Crimea. The, the last thing to say here is that um, a lot of people talk about how bad the Russian army is, but I think we need to be very careful about that. Uh, the Russian uh, military has a lot of capability, but when you plan an attack to last for three or four days and then it's time for a parade and you expect to be greeted with open arms and roses and, and uh, much like the turnover in Crimea, um, it's hard to recover from that kind of poor planning in the middle of a kinetic fight and that's what we've seen. As I said in my opening statement, Russia grossly misread Ukraine, their determination, their capability, the depth of their defenses, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I think that once you're kinetically engaged, it's hard to say, stop, wait, time out. Time out. I, I, I didn't get this right. I need to redo. And when they actually did that, after they were strategically defeated in the north around Kiev and they actually took a time out, they really only took about a 13-day hiatus in ops to reset. 
that would be hard for an incredibly good military to do. And they did not get that right. They should have taken more time. And that's why we see poor performance now in the East. But let's don't, let's don't underestimate what is yet to happen in the East. Right. So if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, and then we gotta turn to some of the audience questions. There's been this debate in the think tank community here in Washington and, and beyond and debate in the public square about the degree to which this war was in part about a bad army which in some ways it was, some ways it wasn't, but how much of it was about a truly terrible plan. And there's this meme going around on Twitter that we're in day 97 of a two day special military operation. In your view, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's more that this was a terrible plan. And then they took the opportunity in April to pause and reorient. And they did not take a long enough opportunity to refurb, refit, reposition, and reorient. Um, they did correct some things. They had a horrible command and control setup in the first days, and that was a big part of losing Kiev. Very much independent actions, uncoordinated by the battalion task groups. The stupidity of piling force upon force upon force on that road that was clogged up and going into the northern part of, of uh, Ukraine and Kyiv and, and no overall commander redirecting forces, et cetera. They were, they had a bad plan and they were executing it as no matter how bad it was. And they made some horrible assumptions, which did not set them well for the battle. If they'd had a great plan from the beginning, this might be a very different situation. Thank you, sir. Um, one of the questions that's just come up in the chat is, uh, in your view, what is Putin's end game? At this point, it seems that this is becoming a frozen conflict. And if so, how should we, the West, proceed with, uh, with sanctions on Russia, layering on additional sanctions, arms assistance to Ukraine, um, et cetera? Sanctions, I'll say it now the fourth time, sanctions have never changed Mr. Putin's actions on the battlefield. Sanctions are important. They are having an important effect. But if we're relying on sanctions to change Mr. Putin's behavior, then we haven't learned our lesson and we will have been inadequate to task for four times rather than three times. And so uh, we've got to do more. Um, I do believe Mr. Putin and his military have seen that they now have to change their overall expectations. I don't see them proceeding uh, further southwest along the coast towards Odessa. I see them now trying to, uh, and, and what we see on the battlefield is they're already starting to fortify some positions, meaning they don't intend to move forward or aft in some of those positions. Um, I think what we see on the battlefield now is a Russia that's trying to solidify the few gains that it's made, a few but important gains that it's made in the Donbass so that uh, Mr. Putin can declare a victory and uh, try to freeze the conflict now with more uh, Ukrainian land in his possession. Um, I, I do not subscribe to conspiracy theories, but there is reporting out there now that it seems that Russia is already talking about in the rear, waiting till another cold season, resetting the game plans so that they can reattack in the Kyiv area. His overall objective really is not about the land in the Donbass. It's not about military defeating Kiev. It's about getting rid of the Zelensky government so that he can install his puppet government to get back to the business of running Ukraine to the profit, profit of he and the other kleptocrats in, uh, in uh, Moscow. Thank you, sir. Um, part of what we've seen as a result of Russia's aggressive actions towards Ukraine is an intense, intensified focus on global food insecurity. And some are arguing that we should use naval convoys to escort merchant vessels in and out of Odessa to get to Ukrainian grain, get it out into the world. So I'm wondering your thoughts on the feasibility of such an undertaking, as well as what are the risks associated, whether it's mined waters or the potential for convoys to be targeted by Russian anti-ship uh, anti cruise missiles. What's your thoughts on that, please? So um, 
uh, I often uh, talk about this in university where I, I uh, talk on these subjects all the time. And that is that Russia is much better than the West at using an all of government approach to attack us. And what I see now with the grain embargo is Russia adding another tool to their all of government attack on the West and their all of government attack on Ukraine. We in the, we in the West tend to be myopically focused in the economic response. We, we don't do a lot diplomatically, informationally or militarily when it comes to Russia. We respond in economic terms, whereas Russia attacks us broadly diplomatically, informationally, militarily, and economically. And I see now that Russia has, uh, has found some limitations in its military tool, especially as the West has now started to resupply and provide for Ukraine's defense, and they need more tools. And now they have this tool of starvation. And the very first thing out of the chute is to release the grain they're asking for us to release the sanctions on Russia. Now, Mr. Putin's behavior hasn't been changed, but it is certainly changing the behavior of those around them, him, and, and they're, I think, now beginning to show cracks and fissures in support for Mr. Putin's uh, wayward venture in Ukraine. And so um, uh, I think that the grain embargo is just one more uh, or blockade, is just one more tool. Should the West uh, step in. Uh, for me, it's pretty easy. Why? What do we say is one of our U.S. Navy's primary missions around the world is the free flow of goods and trade through the common spaces. And now what we have is Russia blocking a common space to cause suffering in the world. The navies of the world should respond. Thank you, sir. Um I do want to pivot back to, uh, to this question of an end game. And there's some that argue that the goal should be to push Russia back to the, the starting line of the 24th of February. I'm wondering if your thoughts are that we should actually try and go a bit further. And the goal should really be to recover all of the territory seized since 2014. Is that even possible? I, the Secretary Kissinger delivered remarks at the World Economic Forum in Davos just last week, where he also said that pushing back beyond the pre-February 24 line would actually, would actually be, uh, would change this into a conflict, not about Ukrainian freedom, but a new war against Russia itself. So what are your thoughts on that? So did uh, Secretary Kinscher actually say that, or did he say that he, we should give up more land? Uh, we should not push back against the new lands that were grabbed by He Russia. said, quote, actually, uh, he said, quote, going beyond the pre-February 24th line would make this conflict not about the freedom of Ukraine, but a new war against Russia itself. Okay, I'll have to go back and read that. I took a different thing from his remarks. Um, I am, uh, here's what I said. We should be about what President Zelensky and the democratic nation of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people are about. We in the West should stay out of the business of dictating to Ukraine what they should accept from Russia. We have uh, chosen not to fight alongside Ukraine. Ukraine is fighting a war against a, a world superpower alone on the battlefield, alone on the battlefield. Yes, we are helping them and enabling them, but we have chosen to let them fight alone on this battlefield and they should dictate the terms under which this war is uh, settled. And if Mr. Uh, President Zelensky and the people of Ukraine are willing to give up more of their land, then we should support their uh, sovereign decisions. But if Mr. Zelensky chooses that he's not going to give up more land, then we should support those decisions as well. I certainly have an opinion I'm not even going to share it. You could probably guess it. But um, the fact of the matter is I don't share it because I don't want to cloud the issue that President Zelensky and the people of Ukraine should choose the, the way that this, uh, uh, this conflict comes to an end. 
I think that gets to another point. You know, there seems to be a growing view in some corners in Europe that it's time to explore ceasefire and peace talks. The argument being that offering Putin an off ramp would end this war sooner and allow him to claim some victory at home. But how as I'm hearing you, it's we should really make sure that we are preserving the agency of Ukraine to dictate its own future. And by outside powers pressuring for ceasefire and peace talks, that would thereby be removing a sense of agency from the Ukrainian political uh, enterprise. Yeah, I jokingly said once, uh, almost a month ago in a speech, and it was seized upon by members of the press. I, I asked how many of you have raised a two-year-old child? And when you're raising a two-year-old child, one of the things you learn very early in that uh, association is that if you allow bad behavior to stand or if you reward bad behavior, you're gonna get more bad behavior. Ergo, my a little bit more refined diatribe in the opening, which says we were inadequate to task in 08, we were inadequate to task in 14, we were inadequate to task 104 days ago. And so we've got more bad behavior. And now we have a choice to decide whether we're gonna set up a situation which encourages more bad behavior in the future, Moldova, Georgia, wherever. And uh, that I think should be the framing argument is not just how to bring this to an end. Oh my gosh, whew, we're over that. But how are we going to prevent this from happening in the future over and over and over? You mentioned Moldova and in the current chapter of this conflict, Moldova finds itself in a challenging security context. It has its breakaway region of Transnistria uh, in April and May. There are several explosions against critical infrastructure elements across Transnistria. So while Ukraine rightfully occupies most of our attention, I would love your thoughts on any possible expansion of Russian aggression in Ukraine to neighboring Moldova. It was you who famously used the term little green men to describe troops in uniform of unclear national origin who helped rebels shape the military situation in Eastern Ukraine in 2014. Do you see potential for little green men in Transnistria? Uh, let me answer your question differently because actually Moldova is sort of making some important moves right now. Uh, clearly, Russia is in a big place in Moldova. Moldova really doesn't have a military able to stand up, certainly just to the Russian garrison in Transnistria. But um, several things have happened, including trying to raise an opposition and raise people to support the Transnistrian Russian garrison, et cetera, et cetera, have failed in this past week in Moldova. Moldovans are showing their, uh, their uh, unlike their non-acceptance of Russia's attempt to dictate their future in this, conf in this conflict. And that's important. It's gonna be really hard for Moldova to continue to stand up to Russia because Russia has the ability to call the shots uh, by its, its military garrison in that country. And so Moldova's fate really lies with the West and how the West will support them and whether their, uh, their uh, politicians and, and uh, civil leaders who have chosen now to sort of push back how long they can stand the pressure. And I think that's really about what's going on in Moldova. Russia has a garrison there. In the last eight years, they have completely refit and refurbed it with better equipment, it's not terribly offensive equipment, but it is certainly more than Moldova could stand up to. And so it's, it's a delicate balance there. And frankly, uh, if, if we are inadequate to task in our response to Russia again, I fear Moldova and or Georgia will be sort of next on the chopping block. Remember that our leaders, have said over and over and over to Mr. Putin, and I think Mr. Putin understands the message. We have said we will defend every inch of NATO. There are people like Moldova and Georgia and Finland and Sweden that are outside of NATO. And Finland and Sweden, of course, are now voting uh, 
uh, in a very different way to change their path of their future. But Moldova and Georgia are clearly outside of that fence uh, that, that we have drawn. I certainly think that this whole episode has given NATO a renewed sense of purpose. And picking up on um, on NATO, just wanted to get in a question from uh, from Lieutenant General Seip, your old friend and the current president of the American Security Project. And he's asking how you see, if you see Putin in the short term worrying about the impact of Sweden and Finland's applications to joining NATO with respect to his current operations. No fair, Storm and Anson asking hard questions. Um, so, so first of all, um, I could not be more happy to see Finland and Sweden taking these actions. I said it when I was the SACUR back in 2013, 14, and 15, that I would love to have those great nations and those great militaries in NATO. Uh, no disrespect, but some of our uh, former Warsaw Pact uh, NATO allies are still fighting to get full compatibility with Western equipment, Western tactics, techniques, and procedures. And again, that's, that's no criticism intended. It's just a fact. They still have things they need to accomplish. Finland and Sweden are almost 100% compatible, not only in equipment, but in tactics, techniques, and procedures with NATO. They have exercised with us at a very high level for some time. We have engaged in actual issues that have happened in their airspace and below their waters, et cetera, uh, together in the past decade. And so these are two great militaries who have a lot of understanding and experience with Russia and Russian aggression. And it is, uh, I think, uh, will be very important to, um, to NATO to allow them in. And then we'll watch how Russia tries to paint this as NATO expansionism. And it, when in fact, this is happening because of Russia's actions in Ukraine. Channeling another uh, question about NATO that comes in from, uh, from General Crispin, who's also a member of our board of directors. He's asking you to assess NATO unity as we approach the second half of the year. Will the essential unity be maintained? If there are any seams, where are they? Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna answer the seams thing because that would be divisive. Uh, you can read the papers and see where some of those issues are. Um, this is a uh, out both sides of the mouth answer, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, Mr. Putin's actions have has driven NATO closer than it's been in a long time. And, um, and we've seen great resolve by the leaders of the NATO nations to help Ukraine, not to fight for Ukraine. Ukraine fights alone, we'll say that now probably the fifth time, uh, but in supporting Ukraine. And, and we see now uh, some who, who have been what some call Russia apologists or Putin apologists who have abandoned those approaches and are now steadfast against what Mr. Putin is doing in Ukraine. It's really hard to sign up to anything that the Russian military is doing in Ukraine right now. And so um, that is working. But we have to recognize that, that our European brothers and sisters, this impacts them economically more than it impacts us on the west side of the Atlantic. And so it's only nat natural for nations to to have uh, reservations about a conflict that is impacting their people um, in ways that that um, you know we need to we need to be cognizant of. And so, yes, I believe the longer this goes on, uh, the the tougher it's going to be to maintain support. Now, here's what I do believe will happen. I think the sanctions now are on for a long, long time. But the continued high-end military support, that may get challenged over time because that's impactful, not only economically, but it's impactful to the militaries. Uh, when nations give away a big chunk of their precision strike capability when it comes to armor, 
uh, that's capability they don't have to use in case Russia invades them. And so there's going to be concern about that, I believe. Great, thank you. Let's, let's just continue on the NATO thread for a while. Get many other questions in the queue I want to get to. But um, as we look to later this month, NATO will be gathering in, uh, in Madrid and they will move to finalize a new strategic concept, which will be the first guiding strategy for the alliance since 2010. And you know, the, in the 2010 strategic concept, they, they sought a true strategic partnership with Russia and meaningful dialogue. That's certainly not an option anymore. What do you expect from a new strategic concept coming out of the Madrid conference? So it's gonna really depend. Um, that new strategic concept was largely completely done before this particular war started, before Mr. Putin declared war on the population of Ukraine. And so uh, I uh, had some insight into that document um, and it corrected a lot of things that needed to be corrected, and it was a pretty good document. Um, the, um, but the, the fact of the matter is, we will need to see whether it has further changed as a result of Mr. Putin's aggression in a neighbor, um, and, uh, and the depth of the depravity of the Russian military action in Ukraine. So, so the real question will be, did the document get even further adjusted based on the ugliness of this war? You've meant, I'm gonna pivot back to one of the questions in the queue, uh, who's asking about um, your concerns, if you see any, about the increasing solidarity between Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Um, are they aligned by nature of their own pursuits, or is this truly emerging into kind of an anti-Western bloc? The entire response of China is going to be a whole nother study, I think, that academics are going to have to get on. China was much more on board at the beginning of this conflict and showed a little more enthusiasm and support. And then I think two things happened. Russia started to look at the unprofessional inhumane actions of the Russian army and distance itself a little from that. And uh, Chinese scholars who have talked to me said the second dynamic in play is that China has seen the veracity of the sanctions on uh, Russia and really has sort of taken a, a pause to say, do we want that to happen to us? Remember in China, uh, the four most spectacular, most recent falls of the Chinese empire has been from within. And uh, I think China understands that if they lose the mandate from heaven by the people because sanctions ruin their economy and their level of living in China, they could face internal problems. I do believe that, that China has taken a pause to say, do we want to get involved with that? Um, clearly, in a public way, uh, China finds usefulness in having Russia on their team. China very much looks at Russia as a little brother, a useful tool, um, and will use them in a, in a sort of uh, a fulcrum way to try to affect the West. But I, I don't yet see a big military sort of uh, uh, joining of Chinese and and Russia to address whatever threat they would convive, contrive. News of the day really centers around uh, an op-ed that President Biden posted in the New York Times that, uh, that was in this morning's paper where he announced the United States will provide Ukraine with more advanced rocket systems and munitions so that it can fight on the battlefield and be in the strongest possible position at the negotiating table. Now they're talking about providing Ukraine with guided multiple launch rocket systems, which have a uh, far greater range, nearly twice the range of the M777 howitzers that the U.S. has already provided. How do you think this will impact dynamics on the ground? Well, first of all, to a large degree, that wasn't a bad op-ed. Uh, if you read it, there was some pretty good stuff in there. There were a couple of things that are worrisome, and one of them is exactly what you're talking about. You've seen this horrible public discussion of what kind of 
MLRS, ATACMs, or uh, HIMARS that we're going to provide. And, uh, and sadly, once again, our nation has been uh, dramatic and quick to point out what they will not do rather than what they will do. And, and what it boils down to is we're going to probably give Ukraine the most limited of the options as far as range. Um, and I, I think that's unfortunate. It is a decision that our commander in chief has made. It is his policy. He sort of leaned that direction for a long time. We've been really, really, really slow getting MLRS to Ukraine. They've been asking for it from day one in the war. Um, and, and all of that is, uh, again, goes back to, I think the West is, is pretty much deterred when it comes to these things seen as quote unquote offensive against Russia. And I think the un unfortunate uh, conclusion to draw is that we in the West are telling Russia, it's okay for you to shoot from Belarus into Ukraine. It's okay for you to shoot from Russia into Ukraine. It's okay for you to shoot from Crimea into Ukraine. It's okay for you to shoot from the Black Sea into Ukraine, but it is not okay for Ukraine to shoot back into Russia. And that to a military man is a unique situation. Again, I've been criticized, but I likened it to uh, a world champion tennis player going to Wimbledon and saying, I will receive serve for the entire match. It does seem like a tiny one hand behind their back a bit. Um, let's continue to talk about the assistance that the West has been providing, particularly the United States. And there's been reporting um, that we have been experiencing some supply chain snags as we seek to restock uh, Stinger anti-aircraft missiles and Javelin anti-tank weapons that have been sent to Ukraine. Industry representatives say that it may take years to secure supply chain, reshore production of certain components. So is, do you have any concerns about our military readiness, given these complications and our ability to restock uh, what is proving to be quite effective weapons? Yes. So to expound, um, we, we have over the past two, three, maybe even four decades, been working towards a military industrial complex that is built around just-in-time logistics. In other words, if the government is buying X number of things from us, we're going to build that supply system that gets us the ability to build exactly X and not a penny more because that dips into the profits we need to share with our shareholders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not nefarious by businesses. This is just a matter of if you've got to compete and the lowest bidder is going to get the contract, you're going to lean out the processes that get you those requirements in order to build um, um, exactly what you're contracted to build. This is the way capitalism and other things work. Again, not nefarious, just the fact of the matter. Now, the large primes have a little bit more capability of, of back stocking a little bit to have some shock absorber in the instance that the government changes its mind and wants more or less of a product after the contract is drawn, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the smaller industries, the subs to the primes, they are even on a more stringent uh, uh, resource line and they do not have the money and the capability to build shock absorbers into theirs. And so um, what we end up with is a system that is just in time logistics with just the amount that the contract calls for. And it leaves us with an inability to surge when surge is required. Um, I, I'm not going to relate which weapon system it was, but I read an article the other day that said, yes, we can, we can pick up that production in second quarter 2026. Okay, and that is no way to be able to <laughs> surge to requirements. And, and again, this is not nefarious on the behalf of the primes. This is the way that we budget and we expect to these primes to cut, 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 cut. And that cutting takes all ability to surge out of their, their response. 
Let's um, pivot briefly to cyber. General Nakasone has confirmed that um, the U.S. has been conducting offensive hacking operations in support of Ukraine in response to the Russian invasion. Uh, the questioner came in through the Q&A function, said that while General Nakasone didn't detail the activities, he said that they were lawful and conducted with complete civilian oversight uh, and through policy decided at DOD. So just your thoughts generally on U.S. offensive cyber in response to the Russian invasion, as well as the potential escalatory risk here. It seems like this is quite, this is something that really could spiral. Um, well, I'm going to disagree with you a bit. My first answer is I'm glad, uh, as you heard before, we are a nation that when we deal with Russia, we tend to use economics and that's it. When we deal with uh, radical Islam, we, we pretty much use military, and that's it. Our opponents attack us broadly across all elements of national power. And uh, I mean, we could spend 10 minutes talking about how uh, the tools of diplomacy, information, disinformation, military, economics were used by Russia against Ukraine and are still being used by Russia against Ukraine. And yet we respond almost completely in the economic response. Um, uh, so the fact that we would use another tool in our quiver, I think is appropriate. And to your latter point, and please, I'm not being harsh or picking on you or anything, but I think, again, I'll just say it more broadly, not aimed at you. I think the West is really fully, almost fully deterred by Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin is the, the big bad wolf that threatens to blow your house down. And we tend to, to take that very close aboard in the West. And, and you just look now at the very, very measured responses of our senior leadership and how fast our senior leadership steps up to tell Mr. Putin what they won't do rather than what they will do. And I think that Mr. Putin's uh, deterrence is working rather well. And uh, so he's gonna keep using it and, and try to deter us from using the tools that he knows we have. Thank you, sir. Um, I do wanna get your thoughts on Turkey. Turkey seems to be in a really tough spot here. Uh, they're the only NATO ally who can actually control Russia's, Russia's access to the theater because they control the Bosphorus and Dardanelles. Uh, they've resisted joining some of the Western sanctions regime. They continue to import Russian oil. President Erdogan has recently said that he's going to oppose Sweden and Finland joining NATO. They've obviously got their own security concerns still coming out of Syria. Uh, and there's concern for Erdogan if, with this country's mounting economic uh, woes and political pressures that could make next year's elections more competitive than they otherwise would be. So just like to get your thoughts on Turkey broadly and how maybe they might be a, a weak link in the, in the NATO chain. So just a small correction, and it's not a large thing, but remember that Russia has brought warships via river from the Caspian Sea and other places to, to, uh, to the Black Sea. So Turkey doesn't control everything that Russia can bring to the issue in, um, in, in the Black Sea. But I, I take your point that the, the control of the Dardanelles, the Bosphorus, and, and primarily the Montreux Convention is that, that tool by which largely um, forces is controlled. Um, uh, here I, I pull away from my somewhat uh, tough stance, and that is, uh, history will record that I am a Turkey apologist. Uh, I have served in Turkey many times. I've deployed to Turkey as a part of our nation's efforts many times. I have great friends in Turkey, some of them in jail now, um, who I served with in Turkey's military. And you cannot argue with the geopolitical importance of just the position of Turkey. And frankly, uh, Turkey, and the people of Turkey and the military and the intelligentsia in Turkey are very different uh, in many ways than Mr. Erdogan, who's running Turkey. And, and 
let's just leave it at this. It's provocative, but many nations in NATO have suffered through some interesting leadership times uh, in the last two, uh, two decades. And so now Turkey is working through uh, a very disparate leadership position. And, and I don't see this as permanent. And I hope that Turkey will find its way back to being a, a more enthusiastic part of NATO. Now, let me say something else. And I say this in all deference and respect. When I was the SACUR, you know, part of your job is commanding the NATO uh, military operations, but part of your job is very much diplomatic and political as you work with capitals to get for your troops what they need from the nations. And so in working with the disparate uh, delegations at, at, Bel at uh, uh, Brussels, um, that's me, I'll turn it off. I'm sorry, I can't control the phone. No worries. Um, so, so one of the things that I found in my um, uh, uh, time uh, in NATO is that, that Turkey's di diplomats and their diplomatic section of their government are some of the most skilled in NATO. It does not surprise me in the least that they see this valuable tool falling into their laps and they say, ah, I can use this to move NATO on things that they have not moved on in the past, Kurds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I fully expected that, that uh, Turkey would use this question of uh, Sweden and Finland to their great advantage. And so um, uh, I think this is not, that would not be what I wanted, but it's a normal course of event of a nation that completely understands how to use diplomacy in their favor uh, when these opportunities arise. Uh, I am hopeful, as others are, that this will resolve itself and we'll move forward. Um, uh, Sweden and Finland are amazing partners now and will be, I think, great, great allies in the future. And we just got to work with Turkey to get through these, these uh, points that they're trying to address through this opportunity. And I know we don't have too much time left, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't also talk about some of the military costs to Russia. There are reports that as many as 30,000 Russian military personnel have been killed or injured thus far. So just given the costs and the reports of low morale within the military, just curious as what you think their capacity is to carry on this fight if it is going to be a matter of you know, the end of 2022 or midway through 2023 and the willingness of the Russian people to actually absorb, absorb those costs. Yeah, what we do know, there is one absolute certainty. Those numbers are wrong. Uh, to, to the degree they're wrong is what will be determined. I mean, I've heard uh, reported as low as 20,000. I've heard reported those same numbers approaching 30,000. Um, the fact of the matter is that it is a large number compared to anything Russia's done recently. For instance, it is now probably almost double what they lost in Afghanistan over their entire time in Afghanistan. And uh, what is also certain, you don't have to believe all the high numbers. You can just count uh, tank bodies and armored personnel carrier bodies and truck bodies and things that are literally littering the entire North and Eastern Ukrainian landscape to understand that Russia has taken a material hit in a big way. But I think the thing that challenges Russia the most right now, and frankly, I'm, I'm sad to say, I think it's probably almost the same problem on the Ukrainian side, is manpower. Uh, uh, Russia is now scraping the bottom of a lot of barrels to get other nations to send people who end up immediately on the front line. And as you read their accounts uh, in Russian sources, cannon fodder, to get to the front and get chewed up for Russia because Russia is running thin on uh, capably trained uh, manpower. And remember that capably trained manpower brought you Buja. 
and has, as soon as we understand what has happened in the Kharkiv area, we'll bring you many more little towns like Busha. But now they're bringing a lot less uh, capably trained people to the fight. And, and we don't talk about it much, but there is some of this dynamic, in fact, in, uh, in the Ukrainian resupply of men to the front. And so uh, there's going to be not only a material drain that's going to have to be dealt with, there is a mental drain, as you said, the, the, the whole uh, idea of the, the morale and fighting spirit of the Russian force. Even though the Ukraine force has been in a fight longer than almost all of these Russians, um, it is fighting for its very life and its country, and so there's a difference. But we will soon see how this manpower thing begins to play out. A great officer who I love and commanded a couple of times and respect because I believe that his um, opinions are well-formed and well-informed, Lieutenant General Retired Ben Hodges, he believes that Russia will cum culminate in the late summer, early fall. Uh, and all of the signs of supply problems, throughput problems, manning problems, even support in the homeland problems, uh, he believes will bring this army to a culminating point. And uh, I find it hard to argue with him, but I think that we should not plan for that. We should plan for a sustained support to Ukraine so that they can bring this to a close. Well, sir, we are nearly at the top of the hour. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to share your, your wisdom, your experience, your insights, and your analysis with the American Security Project and our audience. I uh, truly appreciate it. Um, to our folks on the line, thank you for submitting such great questions and for such great audience engagement. But we are out of time for now. I need to let the general go about his day. Uh, but until next time, I hope everyone stays well and please stay tuned for future coverage from ASP on, uh, on this matter. As I sign off one request, I always learn a lot from these audiences as well. And I love to be challenged. So if you could send me, uh, uh, some, somehow capture the chat and the Q&A and send those to me because that will be my payback and I will take from that the kind of things that are worrying, troubling, uh, or, or maybe people who have a, a good informed retort to my somewhat passionate presentation. Thanks for allowing me to be with you today. I'm off to talk to the BBC. Thank you, sir. We'll certainly capture all the, uh, all the back and forth over the chat and the questions that were submitted. Thank you for taking the time. Okay, see you later. Thank you, sir. Truly a pleasure. All right.